Hello, all of my history-loving friends. Welcome back to the world of Madame Morbid. This is a history channel. I talk about any number of historical topics, many of which have a darker aspect to them, not all. If you like what you see here today, please like the video. Please subscribe to my channel for more content like this. This is part three of the life of the real Molly Brown, who was actually called Margaret Brown. That is how I refer to her, either as Margaret or Maggie. The first episode had to do with her childhood and her life before Titanic. The second episode was the Titanic disaster itself, her time in the lifeboats up until arriving at Carpathia. This episode today will be all about Carpathia and the actions that Margaret took while on board the rescue ship and the way she tried to help fellow survivors and the crew of the Titanic. The people on board Carpathia some of them gave up their staterooms to survivors. They gave them clothing. The barber, who might have extra toiletries, toothbrushes, toothpaste, soap, gave these things out to people. But some people were just in nightgowns. The clothing was gathered so they could dress more appropriately. She said that everyone was just mute. She said everyone was bleary-eyed, their hair hung limp, and they were just in shock. Almost everybody had lost someone. Margaret was one of the luckiest traveling alone. She hadn't lost anybody and she was so grateful for that. Some people literally did not have a dime to their name. Steerage passengers had lost, in some cases, everything they owned in the world. It took no time at all for Margaret to begin what she excelled at and that was to get organized, get names of people, find out who survived, get a list of them, and begin raising money for these poor people who have lost everything. She began approaching all of the wealthy people and collecting money for this survivor's fund. She encountered some very wealthy women who absolutely refused to give. And she had a way to shame these people into giving. The way she did this was to put up a list and to show who had given, how much they had given, and she also placed a list of those who had not. Madeline immediately gave over $500 or a thousand, I'll have to check the exact number, but she gave quite a bit right off the bat. Madeline asked her. Some people who didn't have money on them made pledges. Eventually she raised $10,000 before they even reached New York with more money pledged to give later. She also raised about $5,000 for the crew of the Carpathia who had literally risked their lives running full speed through ice flows that boggled the mind. Captain Rostron said later that only God got them through that because once light came and he could see the amount of ice he had run through that night, he couldn't believe they'd made it. She had the $500 that she wore. She took messages from people, took it to the wireless room and paid for these messages to be sent to their families so people would know they were alive. Most of the messages that Margaret sent out never arrived. They were never sent. There literally was not time. Harold Cottam, who was the Marconi operator on Carpathia, he simply had too many official messages to send to get to these private messages telling people that their loved ones were alive. Margaret's family did not get the message. Most people had no idea Margaret Brown was on board Titanic. Her children knew, Helen knew because she was in Paris when her mother got the message and her son, Lawrence knew because he had sent the message and knew his mother was coming home. Her grandson by this point was fine. By the time she arrived in New York, the baby had recovered from whatever sickness he was suffering from, but her children were absolutely beside themselves. They had no idea if their mother had survived. And at first, names of the survivors were very slow coming in. And when they finally found out that Margaret had indeed survived, they were so grateful and a lot of anxiety was eased for them. JJ reportedly said that when he heard that Margaret had survived, I'm sure he was actually very relieved, but he made the comment something to the effect, of course she survived. She's too mean to sink. 
I think Maggie literally couldn't help herself when it came to being involved, making a difference, doing something. She couldn't just sit there and do nothing. She formed a committee. All the women got together. They wanted to make sure that the people who worked for White Star Line would be protected, that they would have jobs waiting for them because they had made it clear that the second Titanic went down, they were unemployed. She wanted to make sure it was done right by them. She also wanted to make sure that none of the women who had survived this, the steerage women who were immigrants, would be turned away from America because they were now destitute. There was literally a law on the books that said if you had nothing, you could not enter the country. And women were terrified of this. It turns out that law in, was not enforced when it came to the survivors of Titanic. And Margaret wanted to make sure of that. Margaret spoke several languages fluently, and she used this skill to speak with immigrant passengers. She encountered several people that really made an impression on her, and one was she said she met a woman of the second class who was hysterical, and she was screaming, where's my baby, where's my baby, find my baby, and Margaret said she was pulling out hunks of hair from her head in her grief. And Margaret says that the woman had been handing her baby to the lifeboat and dropped it as she was doing so. There's no evidence that anything like that ever happened. However, there was a survivor in the third class named Leah Axe. And I don't know if I'm saying that her last name correctly. But according to the story of Leah, she had her infant son with her and the story is that a man a very distraught man said I'll show you women and children first or women and children only and grabbed the baby and threw him overboard it is said that he landed in a lifeboat that was either lowering or had already lowered and a woman caught him now, this woman thought that this child was a gift from God Leah did get in a, into a lifeboat she, uh, she made it to Carpathia and she was said to have been in a state very similar to what Margaret is describing. As she finally felt well enough to move about the ship, Leah heard her baby crying and she found him with the woman who had, who had caught him. But this woman, believing he is a gift from God, refuses to give him back to his mother. And the story is that Captain Rostron ended up having to solve the issue and that it was through the mother describing something unique to her son that only the mother would know. And I've heard different things about how she did this. Um, I'm not really sure what it was, but she proved enough to Captain Rostron that it was her child. I don't know for sure if this is who Margaret encountered, but it's the only story that's similar enough to make me think that that may be who Margaret encountered. Margaret also encountered James McGow, who had knocked on her door and told her to seek safety. She says his name slightly wrong. She spells it wrong, but it's pretty clear that's who she's talking about. All four of the men he was staying with in his stateroom on E-deck survived because they did not listen to the steward who told them to go back to bed. Instead, they went up to the boat deck and they got on a boat, one of the first boats being lowered when no one else wanted to get in. Spencer Silverthorne would make up a story later in his life about being pulled from the water. A lot of men did this because they had such shame about surviving when so many women and children did not. Margaret, being the feminist that she was, absolutely thought it was ludicrous that men should feel bad about surviving the Titanic disaster. She thought there being a rule of women and children only was cruel, actually. She said that the death the men had was somewhat of an easy death. Uh, when you die of hypothermia, it is, you somewhat just slowly lose consciousness and go to sleep. But the women who were sent away without a husband to support them, their only option was to get married again. She said it made these women face a slow death, 
through poverty and want. Margaret absolutely loathed J. Bruce Ismay, the owner of White Star Line or the managing owner of White Star Line who had survived. He had put himself in a lifeboat. He faced unbelievable ridicule the rest of his life for surviving. And Margaret seemed to agree with this. And it was not so much that he survived actually is that she thought he wasn't doing his job. She felt she, through all of this organizing to try to take care of the people who had survived this, to make sure the company was good to its employees, he should be doing that job, not her. And she very much resented the fact that he locked himself in a room and refused to come out. He never came out while on board Carpathia. And she seems to indicate that he actually was trying to stop her in doing a lot of the work that she was trying to do, such as stopping meetings that they were having in the dining saloon to discuss forming the, the, uh, the survivor's fund. She called him the secluded, uh, what did she call him? The secluded autocrat or the secluded plutocrat, something like that. She just really had no love for Jay Bruce, Jay Bruce Ismay and his role in all of this. She stayed on board with these women. Some were afraid, even after they reached New York, they were afraid to disembark immediately. So she spent the night on Carpathia that first evening. Survivors were mobbed when they reached New York by reporters and crowds of just people who wanted to look at all of them. So the next morning when she hoped that would be better, these other women got off and Margaret set herself up at the Ritz Carlton in New York City where she helped those remaining find relatives or loved ones. Some of them were meeting friends of the family they'd never met before. She helped them find their people. She refused to leave New York until everyone had found who they were looking for. She would operate the survivor's fund for the rest of her life. She was angry that she was not invited to testify at the Titanic inquiry. Only six women testified and none of them were from lifeboat six. So she wanted to make sure her story got out. She wrote it in its entirety and it was reported not only in the Newport Herald, but it was picked up by papers in other areas of the country as well. It was published in three parts in May of 1912. And then Archibald Gracie, a survivor who had survived on upturned collapsible B with Charles Lightoller, he wrote one of the first accounts of the Titanic sinking and he wanted to use Margaret's account in his book. And his book is one of the reasons everyone thinks Margaret was on deck A or B because he wrote that McGow spoke to her through a window. When in reality, he just knocked on her door. But when she says she looks out, people began to assume she was looking out a window, but she was just looking out her cabin door. She still had her little Egyptian talisman. And she would later give this to Captain Rostron, who cherished it for the rest of his life. I saw that at the Titanic Museum in Branson. I also saw the loving cup that she raised money to give Captain Rostron after Carpathia's rescue as well. And I, I met her granddaughter at that and I saw the loving cup there in the museum. It was an amazing experience. Who I really enjoyed talking to though was Captain Rostron's granddaughter. I really enjoyed talking to her. She was a wonderful lady. Thank you so much for joining me today. There will be one more episode about Margaret Brown's life after Titanic. And then we will be done with this series and move on to another kick-ass lady, Pearl White, heroine of the silent movie screen.